Okay. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen. Uh, do you see dimension theorem at your end? Yes, ma'am. Okay, excellent. Any questions from last time? Okay, uh, so seems like there are none. Uh, okay, so let's just quickly recall. Uh, last time we ended our time by uh, stating and proving the dimension theorem for nth order linear ordinary differential equations. Yeah, let's quickly recall the statement. So suppose you have nth order um, linear differential equations whose coefficients uh, p1, p2, pn minus 1, pn are continuous on a certain interval i in r also this equation is in standard format which means that the coefficient of the highest order is one so uh, suppose we are looking at the solution space of this homogeneous equation then one we all agree that the solution space is actually a vector space over the real line and two, uh, the solution space actually has dimension n, right? And we prove that by uh, using the existence and uniqueness theorem uh, for the initial value problem, correct? Uh, so this was done last time. Uh, having understood the dimension theorem, you know, uh, the next natural question is to now uh, find out the basis of the solution space, right? Which means that find n linearly independent solution of a nth order linear differential equation with continuous coefficients, correct, on certain interval i. So towards that end, uh, we recall, how did we do this uh, when we were dealing with second order linear differential equation? We uh, appeal to the Ronskian, right? So remember, the Ronskian of two differentiable functions, y1 and y2, is defined as a determinant of a certain matrix, right? Um, Similarly, uh, if we have n differentiable uh, functions y1, y2, yn, then the Ronskian of these n functions is given as a determinant of an n cross n matrix whose rows are uh, defined as follows. So the first row is y1, y2, yn. The second row is first derivatives of uh, each of these functions and so on. The third row is the second derivative of uh, these functions. And uh, uh, the last row is n minus one at the derivative of these functions. You know, so all of this is under the assumption that each of these functions y1, y2, yn is uh, n minus one times differentiable. Yeah, okay. Correct, is that okay? Uh, so what is that we want to do uh, with the Ronskian? We would like to come up with the criteria for linear independence of uh, n functions using the Ronskian, much like what we did for second order linear differential equations. Okay, let's see. Um, so let's quickly recall what is the test for linear independence that we were able to establish uh, in n equal to two setting. We call the homogeneous second order linear differential equation. Uh, y double prime, so d square y by dx square plus px dy by dx plus qx y equal to zero. Remember, p and q were assumed to be continuous on an interval i on the real line. Then we showed that two solutions, y1 and y2 of this differential equation on the interval i are linearly dependent if and only if the Ronskian of y1 and y2 is zero at some point of the interval i, correct? So I hope everybody is with me up till uh, this point. Uh, what is that we would like to do now? A similar statement is true for dimension n also, yeah? All right, for order n also. Uh, so consider a nth order linear differential equation, homogeneous nth order linear differential equation such that in standard format, such that the coefficients p1 up to pn are all assumed to be continuous on an interval i, then uh, we say that n solutions y1, y2, yn of the above differential equation are linearly independent. So these n solutions are solutions of this differential equation on the interval i are linearly dependent if and only if the Ronskian of y1, y2, yn is zero at some point of the interval i. 
all right uh, so i hope this statement is okay with everybody present here yeah yes uh, so let's provide a proof uh, so let's uh, do one way um, so which way would we like to do first so suppose that y1 y2 yn are uh, solutions of uh, the given homogeneous differential equation on the interval i and so assume that y1 y2 yn are linearly dependent what is that we are required to show we will show that their ronsky n is zero at some point in the interval i correct so let's see yes uh, right so uh, let's see uh, so you know i would like to emphasize that this part of the proof does not actually require y1 y2 yn to be solutions of the ode even if y1 y2 yn are not solutions but you know for any n linearly dependent functions their ronsky n is going to be zero uh, at some point this is true uh, without the assumption that y1 y2 yn are actually solutions of some ode much like what we discussed for n equal to 2 case uh but nevertheless let's see the proof so as i said let's start with y1 y2 yn uh n linearly dependent functions on the interval i which means that by the definition of linear dependence there must be k1 k2 kn not all zero such that k1 y1 plus k2 y2 plus kn yn is zero and this holds on the interval i correct so what we can do is we can differentiate once right that would give us k1 y1 prime so this is you know k1 d1 by dy1 by dx all the way plus kn dy n by dx equals 0 right and we can go on right we can differentiate uh, as many times as we are allowed to which means that we can differentiate up to order n minus 1 which will give us that k1 n minus 1 derivative of y1 All the way plus k n uh, n minus one the derivative of y n is zero. Correct? Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. So what is that we are going to do? Uh, so let's let's fix some point in the interval i x. Uh, let's call it x not temporarily, and let's write down the above uh, sort of system of equations in matrix format. So what is this gain? This is saying that if you look at this matrix in parent, uh, that's that's what you. Uh, sort of see at your end this uh, uh, applied to this uh, column vector k1 k2 kn gives you uh, the zero vector correct correct and what is that yeah. we know we know that uh, there are k1 k2 kn not all zero satisfying the system of equations right so what can you tell tell about this matrix determinant is zero it means that determinant must be zero at some point x not of the interval i and we are done right so if you have n linearly dependent functions then their determinant must be zero, their ronsky n must be zero at some point right so mind you this is exactly the ronsky n of y1 y2 yn evaluated at the point x not by definition right so please note that this part of the proof does not you make use of the fact that y1 y2 yn are actually solutions of a nth order homogeneous ordinary differential equation right this is true in much more generality now what are we going to do we are required to prove the converse statement what is that we are required to prove suppose that y1 y2 yn are such that their ronsky n at some point of the interval i is zero then we are required to show that y1 y2 yn are linearly dependent on the interval i now this would require the information that y1 y2 yn are actually solutions of a nth order linear differential equation with continuous coefficients right uh, much like what we did for uh, order 2 case okay so let's uh, provide uh, let's see the proof uh, for the converse part so suppose that the ronsky n of y1 y2 yn at some point x not of the interval i is zero okay now uh, let's consider the linear system of equations uh, what is this equation of system of equation now uh, so let's just write that down yeah so uh, k1 y1 x not plus kn yn x not equal to zero k1 uh, first derivative of y1 evaluated at x not plus kn 
first derivative of y n evaluated at x not equal to zero. Yeah, and k one n minus one the derivative of y one evaluated at x not plus k n n minus one the derivative of y n evaluated at x not equal to zero. Okay. Now, uh, so we uh, we we make the following claim, right? We say that since the Ronskian of y one on uh, y one y two y n at x not is zero by assumption, there must be k one k two k n not all zero solving the above linear system. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, everybody agrees with me. Yeah. So there, we are guaranteed that there exists a k one, k two, k n, not all zero uh, simultaneously, which solve the above linear system of equations, right? Now, what are we required to show? We are required to show that y one, y two, y n are linearly dependent. Yeah. So we are looking for some constants uh, which will sort of give that relation between y one, y two, y n. Okay. But we have sort of been able to show that there exists k one, k two, k n, not all zero, which satisfies you know the first equation at the point x not, right? Okay, all right. So what do we do at this point? Much like what we did for the second order uh, case, we will cook up an appropriate initial value problem and then appeal to the existence and uniqueness theorem there, right? Okay. So what we will do is we will say that. Let's set y to be uh, k1 y1 plus k2 y2 plus k n y n. So where is y defined? Y is defined on the interval i for any point x on the interval y. I am going to define y like this. And what are k1 k2 k n? K1 k2 k n are the you know uh, uh, non-trivial solution uh, which we obtain by solving the system of equations on the previous slide. Okay. Having defined y like this, we make this observation that uh, the way we have chosen k1, k2, k n ensure that y at the point x not is zero. So is the first derivative of y at the point x not. In fact, all derivatives of y up to order n minus one exist and are zero at the point x not. Correct. This is uh, because of the choice of k1, k2, k n. All right, uh, okay. And what's the next thing? So with this information, I say that let's look at the following initial value problem. Yeah. So this is I have I am given the uh, nth order uh, linear homogeneous differential equation. We were given that y1, y2, y n are n solution of this homogeneous uh, equation. I am going to throw in these initial conditions. I am going to say that uh, y at x not uh, and you know all possible uh, derivatives of y up to order n minus one. So sorry, this is not y n minus one. This is y bracket. So this is the derivative. Yeah, y of n minus one. I will fix this uh, typo uh, when I post this on Moodle. Uh, is zero at the point x not. So now I have an initial value problem. So we know that since p1, p2, p n are continuous on the interval i, the existence and the uniqueness theorem tells us that this initial value problem admits exactly one solution on the interval i. Correct? And so this is one information. And the other point is that y that we have defined upstairs must by must is also a solution, right? Is that correct? So y is a solution of this uh, differential equation, and y satisfies the initial condition, right? So by the existence and uniqueness theorem, y must be identically zero. Is that okay? So that is saying that k one y one plus k two y two plus k n y n are identically zero throughout the interval i. And what is known as k one, k two, k n are not all zero, right? So what is that we have been able to show? We have been able to show that there exists k one, k two, k n not all zero, such that k one y one plus k two y two plus k n y n is equal to zero on the interval i. This is exactly saying that y one, y two, y n. Are linearly dependent on the interval i, and we are done. This is what we were required to prove. Is that okay? 
with everybody yeah. present here yes yeah yeah the proof is much like what yes, we did, yes, yeah what we did for order 2 case exactly the same proof all right uh, ma'am so here also like uh, with the ron skin uh, all the properties such as uh, if it's zero one then it will be zero always types all those also work here like right right so we will try and see you know what happens to that yeah so all of that comes from okay. so for example the property that you mentioned uh, follows from the ebels formula right so we we are going to discuss that that does the ebels formula hold for uh, hold here uh, right nth order equations also we we'll see i that. don't think it will though right we'll so, see we'll just see in a uh, you know couple okay, of okay let's just see yeah, so, yeah. yes please ma'am how uh, you put that k1 uh, that last line k1 plus y1 equal to 0 Uh, I see because see we say that we cooked up this initial value problem right we say yes, that uh, the y which is written you know the first line on the slide y is a solution of this initial value problem that's one yes ma'am right identically zero function is also a solution of this initial value problem that's two and three the existence and uniqueness theorem for the initial value problem tells us that there is exactly one solution on the interval i so that means that y must be identically zero and by the definition of y y must be identically zero on the interval i so by the definition of y you know y is defined like this k1 y1 plus k2 y2 plus kn y n oh. yeah is that okay yes ma'am yes yes uh, understand okay. yeah so is everybody with with me up till this point yes ma'am yes ma'am Okay. All yeah, right. Great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have proved that y one, y two, y n are linearly dependent. Yeah. So again, you know, I would emphasize that there is one part of this theorem uh, which does not require the fact that y one, y two, y n be the solutions of an ODE, but the other way, at if the Ronskian is zero at some point, to say that y one, y two, y n are linearly dependent on the interval i, that requires the fact that y one, y two, y n are solutions of a certain homogeneous differential equation, and uh, you know all of that uh, with continuous coefficients on the interval i. Yeah, something to be careful about. Okay, all right. Uh, so having discussed this, uh, let's see what we have next. Okay, so the next thing is the Ebel's formula, which uh, which let's just quickly recall. What is the Ebel's formula? That uh, so let's recall for order two equation d square y by dx square plus p x dy by dx plus q x y equal to zero. Uh, recall that the Ronskian of any two solutions uh, y one and y two of the second order homogeneous differential equation. Uh, follows uh, you know uh, the given formula right uh, so the ronskian of y1 y2 at any point x is equals the ronskian of y1 y2 at a fixed point x not times a certain exponential yeah and you know there's only uh, you know dependence of the function p here q actually plays no role right uh, and this is true throughout the interval i okay uh, so this ebel's formula depends only on p and not on q yeah and since we have an exponential here uh, we would sort of quickly recall that what it implies is that if y1 y2 are two solutions of uh, a second order homogeneous differential equation in standard format with the coefficients p and q continuous on a certain interval i then their ronskian is either identically zero on the interval i or never zero on the interval i yes so what we would like to do we would like to establish an nth order analog uh, of the above ebel's formula and let's see yeah uh, surprisingly it holds true and let's uh, sort of uh, see what is the statement so we have an nth order linear differential equation homogeneous linear differential equation in standard formats uh, with the coefficients p1 p2 pn assumed to be continuous on an interval i and suppose that y1 y2 yn are n solutions of this uh, homogeneous differential equation on the interval i then the ronskian of y1 y2 yn at any point x is actually the ronskian determinant of y1 y2 yn at some fixed point x not times an exponential yeah and this exponential you know again there is only dependence on p1 which is the coefficient of n minus 1th derivative here yeah 
and this formula depends only on p1 and not on p2 p3 and up all the way up to pn right um, so much like uh, you know order 2 case you would have the same thing here that if you have a linear nth order homogeneous differential equation whose coefficients are continuous on an interval i and you have n solutions of this homogeneous differential equation either the ronskin determinant of this n solutions uh, is either identically zero on the interval i or it's never zero on the interval i much like the order 2 case right uh, so i hope the statement is okay with everybody uh, present here is that okay yes yes ma'am yeah so let's let's see the proof uh, okay um so the proof you know requires actually working with the determinants but let's uh, see okay um okay so what is it the ronskin remember ronskin of y1 y2 yn is a certain n by cross n determinant right the first row of this determinant is y1 y2 yn evaluated at x the second row is the first derivative of y1 y2 yn evaluated at x Uh, right and so on right so i'm going to invent some notation here i'm going to write down y equal to y1 y2 yn be the first row vector in the ronskin determinant of y1 y2 yn at the point x right which means that i can write you know the second row as y prime the sec the third row as uh, you know the sec uh, second derivative y and uh, you know the last row as the nth my n minus 1th derivative y what are these these are the row vectors in the ronskin determinant of uh, y1 y2 yn evaluated at x right so uh, so you know just sort of uh, setting this notation this is exactly saying that the ronskin determinant of y1 y2 yn at x is same as the determinant of y first derivative y the second derivative y all the way till n minus 1th derivative y yeah remember you know each of these entries here are you know rows rows yeah they are row vectors all right okay uh, so now what are we required to do uh, let's do this the first claim is the following that if i differentiate this with respect to the variable x what is that i am going to get i claim that this is going to be the same as the determinant of this matrix obtained by the first row the second row all of that remains as it is up to n minus 1th row the nth row, last row you replace by the nth derivative of y so what goes here what is happening here can somebody help me uh, ma'am i think this is the property of the determinants correct so you are using the property of the determinant that the derivative of a n cross n determinant is the sum of n n cross n determinants obtained by differentiating the first row. row in the first one the second yeah, row in the second yeah. one and you know the nth row yeah. in the last one respectively right yes is that okay Yes. yes so this, this is just using the properties of the determinant. So you know, if you are confused with the notation, just pick up a pen and paper, write it down. This will fall through. Yeah, the, all that is required here and nothing else, right? So the de the derivative of the determinant is the sum of n determinants, and each of them uh, is uh, obtained by differentiating uh, one row at a time, as you said, right? Okay, great. All right. So having understood this, what is that I am going to do? I am going to multiply the last row of you know the determinant of uh, of this matrix here by p one, right? So if I do that, what will I get? So this is some notation here. P one, the Ronskin of uh, y one, y two, y n, is the same as. Uh, so I I absorb that p one here, right? P one. So I'm I'm multiplying the last row here. So uh, p one. And the nth n minus one derivative of y. Okay, all right. Uh, so what does it mean? So now I'm going to set, uh, you know, add the last two equations. So on the left hand side, what will I have? I will have the derivative of w plus p one times w. And on the right hand side, what am I going to do? So I'm again, you know, going to use the properties of the determinant. So I will get here. The first n minus one rows as it is, and the last row will be. the n nth derivative of y plus p1 times the n minus 1th derivative of y correct is that okay yeah yes uh, all right 
Now, what does this achieve for me? I say that the rows of this last determinant are linearly dependent. And that is why the right hand side is zero. And that is why I get the left hand side is also zero. Is that okay? Ma'am, would you repeat the last statement again? Ah, so I'm saying that look at the right hand side of the second last equation here. So this is determinant of y, y prime, the second derivative of y, you know, uh, and the n minus one, n minus two derivative of y. And the last row is nth derivative of y plus p1 times n minus 1th derivative of y. You know, remember y1, y2, yn, what are those? y1, y2, yn are solutions of this nth, sorry, y1, y2, yn are solutions of this homogeneous differential equation. Is that okay? Each y1, y2, yn satisfies this ODE, right? And what is that I'm writing as y? y is, is the row vector whose, whose entries are y1, y2, yn, right? So, you know, so all of that is being used here that, you know, you replace this last row by, so this least, the row of this last determinant are linearly dependent because of this fact. And hence, this right hand side is zero. Ma'am, but uh, to get a zero, we have to multiply each of them with a polynomial term, right? Like functions of x. Yes. So... Will it still mean that they are linearly dependent if they are uh, functions of x and not constants? So, but that's okay. No, you can pull them out. Just use the properties of the determinant. No, no, no problem. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're saying that this this language is not correct, right? I should not write that the row uh, the rows are linearly dependent. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, uh, actually, that point I'm not very much clear. Okay, so instead of saying this, all I'm trying to say is that use the fact that y1, y2, yn are actually solutions of the homogeneous differential equation, right? And y is this row vector, right? So use yeah. that fact and, you know, you you, you replace this last, uh, last uh, sort of, what is this, uh, entry here. Uh, and what okay, you okay, okay. Right? Right, right, right. Right. right? And that's all, that's all. Uh, right. And use the properties of the determinant and that's all. Yes? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's true. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, I have this doubt that uh, while writing the determinant of the uh, Ronskian, I mean, when we uh, differentiated the Ronskian determinant, why are we getting only one term? We would, we should be getting n terms, right? All other terms vanish. Why is that? Uh, oh. They vanish. Why is that? Right. So you're right. So when you're differentiating, the derivative is sum of n, n cross 1, n cross n determinants, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. But why, why, why is, what's, what's happening here? We get repeated. Um, huh. So let's just go over this slowly. Yeah, I'll give you, you know, two minutes to think about it and then we proceed. Huh? And so the first term will have y prime in the first two rows. The second term will have y double prime in the second and Correct. third row. Correct. So they will vanish. Oh, All of them right. will vanish and only one of this will survive and that's this. Is that okay? I, I'll just write down. Maybe it's still not clear. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, uh, so what is that I'm trying to say? Uh, so uh, so what is uh, the Ronskian? Uh, so the Ronskian is, uh, so this is the notation that we are using, right? So this is uh, y1, y2, uh, yn, the first derivative. You know, of course, all of this is evaluated at x. I am just writing it. Is that correct? Yes. So when I differentiate it, yeah, so I, as you said, you are going to get n determinants. What is the first one going to be? The first one is going to be y1 prime, y2 prime, yn prime. And all of that, all other terms remain as it is. Correct? Is that okay? 
This is the yes, first sorry. first determinant. Y two n minus one, y n n minus one, right? Right? And likewise. So this is going to vanish. Why? Because the first two rows are identical. Is that okay? Yeah, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, and similarly, you know, when you do the second one, the second one will have this. Yeah, it's going to be y. Sorry, there's no going to be a prime here. Y two, y n, y n. This one will remain. This will be become y one double prime. Correct, and so on. So all of these will vanish, and there will be only one determinant that will remain, and that's what is written on the slide. Is that okay? Is everybody with me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So is this okay? Uh, is this proof okay? Meaning, not uh, we have not sort of completed the proof, but we have uh, so. So, do we all conclude that uh, the Ronskin determinant will satisfy this first-order differential equation that uh, W prime plus P one W is equal to zero? Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right. So, you know, all you are using is determinant sort of behaves like a linear function of uh, rows of the matrices, right? Uh, and Sort of uh, the properties of the datum. Okay, so having understood this, uh, now what do we do? We solve for this, right? We solve this first order differential equation: W prime plus P one W equal to zero. So this is a variable separable equation. So let's integrate. What is that we get? W at x is going to be some constant of integration times an exponential, um, and exponent is minus of integral. Uh, x not to x of p1 right uh, for some constant c right and uh, let's plug in x equal to x not to evaluate this constant and the constant turns out to be ronskin evaluated at the point x not so what is gives us is the uh, abel's formula for nth order differential equation what is that we have the ronskin of y1 y2 yn uh, at Any point x is actually equal to the Ronskin of y1, y2, yn evaluated at a fixed point x not, multiplied by a certain exponential. And what is to be remembered here is that this exponential actually depends only on the coefficient of the n minus one th order term in the uh, homogeneous differential equation that we started off with. All right, much like what we have for second order differential equation. Yes. So is this okay? Okay, everybody with me up till this point. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So shall we go I'm, ahead? Yes, yes. I mean, the previous slide. How? Uh, how did we conclude that the rows are independent, linearly independent? How did we say that rows are linearly independent? Sorry, ma'am. Dependent. In the last one. Here, here is that what you are asking? Yes, I don't know if you, yeah. Yes, see, see why? So why? Remember this notation. Why is y one, y two, y n, y one, y two, y n are solutions of the nth order equation, right? So each y one, y two, y n satisfies that nth order equation, right? So for example, y one. So so you know so you know you can replace this 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 entry here. In terms of you know uh, some combination of uh, all derivatives of y up to order n minus two, and use the property of determinant to say that uh, this vanishes. Is that okay? Um, so basically, basically we have to use the given differential equation to yes, substitute yes, yes, y raised to yes, n plus yes, p one y raised right. to n. Get rid of this nth and n minus one derivatives of y. You what you have here will be an expression involving all derivatives of y up to order n minus two, including y itself. Yes, and then you use the properties of the determinant. Ma'am, the rigorous calculations are not shown. It's not shown, but you can do it, right? Is that okay? Isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes. yes. It, it, meaning there's not much here, right? All you have to do is, you know, you multiply one row of the, you know, what happens if you multiply one row of a matrix by some some number, let's say some some p two, well, not number, but a function p two. Then the determinant is multiplied by p two. You know, all those th sort of things. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, and determinant B is like a linear function on uh, rows of matrix. So things like those, right? Which uh, I'm, I'm sure you know, all of you will do very well, uh, much better than I would, you know, <laughs> right? Isn't it? Yeah, is yes, that okay? Yeah, is that okay? All right. Yes, yeah. So does that you know settle your doubt? Uh, are you sort of uh, comfortable with the fact that actually right hand side of this equation would be zero? Yes, ma'am. It seems. Yeah. So. Yeah. Is that okay? All right. You know, yeah, all you do is you know pick up a paper and a pen and write and it'll fall through. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, all right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so having done this, let's just summarize what is that we learned about nth order linear homogeneous differential equation. So suppose that we are given an nth order linear homogeneous differential equation. Whose coefficients p1, p2, pn are continuous on the interval i. This equation is in standard format, which means that the coefficient of the highest uh, uh, highest order term is one. And suppose that y1, y2, yn are solutions of this differential equation. All right. Uh, then the statement is that the following statements are all equivalent. The first one, which says that um, y1, y2, yn is the set is linearly independent on the interval i. This is equivalent to saying that every solution of uh, equation one can be written as a linear combination of y1, y2, yn. Yeah, so this is, uh, we are invoking the dimension theorem here that uh, uh, I have n linearly independent solution. So that must be the basis, correct? Uh, statement three is that the Ronskian of uh, y1, y2, yn is non-zero at some point in i. So we just proved this uh, in the beginning of the lecture today. And by Abel's formula, this is equivalent to saying that Ronskian of y1, y2, yn is actually non-zero throughout the interval i. Yeah. So is this okay? Uh, do you all agree that we have actually proved this theorem rigorously? Uh, uh, in the class uh, during the course of our lectures. Yes, ma'am. Yes? Ma yes. Uh, any, any further questions at this point? Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so if there are no further questions, uh, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, okay, so you know, much like what we did with, uh, uh, for the case when n was two, order two equation, we will first look at uh, nth order linear differential equations with constant coefficients and then, then look at the general case and then look at non-homogeneous uh, ordinary differential equations, right? So uh, it is useful to introduce this operator notation. Um, let's recall, we are going to write as dk, the operator dk as the kth derivative with respect to the x variable. And suppose that I have two um, linear differential, homogeneous differential equations, uh, which I'm going to re represent using uh, constant coefficient differential operators, L and M. Um, so A0 up to AN and B0, B1, BM are all uh, real numbers. And um, so I'm identifying a, a differential equation with a, with an operator, right? Um, and what is sort of particular in this uh, case is that I am looking at constant coefficient linear differential operator, so that uh, correspondingly we are looking at constant uh, coefficient uh, homogeneous differential equations. Okay. Now, what is that we uh, note here? The first point is that the operators dr and ds commute, right? So which means that whether I apply ds first or whether I apply dr first makes no difference, right? So that is important uh, and useful. So this would imply that the operators L and M will also commute. Right? So whether I apply M first or whether I apply N first does not matter. Yeah? See, this is a sort of to be taken care of. See, when I say L, M, so the left hand side here means that I am looking at the function obtained by applying M first and then applying L to the resulting function. 
the right hand side means that i am looking at the function obtained by applying l first and then applying m to the resulting function in general the two may not be the same but as long as we are working with constant coefficient things we are fine is what this observation is telling us is that okay yes ma'am yes now yeah, yeah. so you know uh, how did we solve constant coefficient uh, differential equations uh, you know constant coefficient linear dif homogeneous differential equations when we were uh, uh, dealing with order 2 how did we solve those e power mx that's true but even before that we looked at the associated characteristic polynomial right so in order to figure out what m should be correct uh, yeah. yeah and then e to power mx would give us solution so much the same would be here but here the characteristic polynomial would be a degree n polynomial so it may not be sort of very simple to solve that all the time but you know we'll see yeah okay all right uh, so if uh, the nth order uh, uh, homogeneous differential equation and the associated operator is given as the following you know a0 dn plus a1 dn minus 1 plus an minus 1 d uh, plus an i yeah i is the identity operator then we are going to write down the associated characteristic polynomial uh, so this would be a degree n polynomial in this case yeah a0 x to power n plus a1 x to power n minus 1 plus an x plus an and uh, so instead so we will look at roots of this characteristic polynomial much like what we did for order 2 a case but as i said the situation here is little more complicated okay uh, mom how did we get the characteristic polynomial in this case so we just said you know we will replace d by x and we get a polynomial acha okay okay nothing else right so i i think you just confused with the notation instead of d if i had a you know d instead of a capital d here if i have a you know y n here you know y n means the n nth derivative of y then this would be the characteristic polynomial isn't it Uh, yes ma'am no ma'am actually in for the first uh, while we were dealing with second order differential equations we first put the solution e to the power mx and then formulated correct, the correct 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 it's much it's the same thing here only yeah with the understanding that that's a solution and that you know the way to go forward is to look at characteristic polynomial correct okay it's 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 the same philosophy yeah uh, yeah so maybe i should have uh, sort of said that yeah so that's exactly the thing here as well right uh, okay um, so before we actually take up some examples you know it's useful to uh, run through some theory which will uh, sort of simplify life uh, so let's see uh, what is this theorem saying that suppose that i have two constant coefficient linear differential operators l and m then when do we say these two operators are equal yeah so we say that l is equal to m only if the associated characteristic polynomials are the same yeah so you know by definition here you know, two operators are equal if they apply to the same function and always produce the same result right so uh, this is saying that this is equivalent to checking that the two polynomials the associated characteristic polynomials are the same okay all right um, and what is the second one so the second one is saying that the following yeah so you look at the constant differential constant uh, linear differential operator l plus m and look at the associated characteristic polynomial that is p subscript l plus m so that polynomial is going to be the same as the sum of the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator l and the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator m right so this is statement 2 now statement 3 is the following now statement 3 is considering the linear differential operator lm the product um, lm so that's another uh, constant coefficient linear differential operator now we can write down the associated characteristic polynomial we are going to denote it by p subscript lm statement 3 saying that the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator lm is the same as the um, is what we obtain by taking the product of the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator m l and uh, 
the uh, characteristic polynomial associated to the operator m uh, excuse me ma'am yes please uh, i just wanted to clarify uh, that p lm lm means uh, applying uh, m to a function and applying l to a function what do i get we multiply them right and not m, uh, l dot m see uh, what is so you are saying composition and product is that what yeah, you are trying to right. say yeah. see this is product here this is product l m is product okay. composition you have a parenthesis okay. right. yeah yeah okay thank you uh, yeah um okay and uh, statement 4 is that for any scalar lambda you can also look at the differential operator lambda times l and the associated characteristic polynomial p uh, subscript lambda times l this is going to be the same as uh, what we get by looking at the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator l and multiplying it by lambda yeah so all of this looks like very trivial but it's useful when you are actually doing some uh, you know examples so uh, i think uh, what we do is um, so most of them are quite straight forward um just from the definition uh, let let just uh, sort of uh, for the sake of completeness uh, see the proof of uh, statement 1 yeah okay. uh, and uh, i will leave sort of 2 3 and 4 for you to fix on your own uh, ma'am Ma yes please uh, here p l plus m uh, is what matlab ye kya hoga matlab agar p ke wale example ko le to matlab l jo hai See, P L is a polynomial. P M is also polynomial. Yes, Sum of two polynomials is a polynomial. That's all. We'll see some exam. We have not seen examples as yet. Oh. Yeah, but uh, it's a polynomial, no? Uh, what? Uh, I think, मतलब uh, L plus M not have any effect on the power of X. Correct. Summation does not effect have a effect on the power. Meaning, order of an equation is what you want to say. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think my means as P L have a power up to x to power m and m have a x to to the power m. Then L plus m uh, term x n plus x m something like. See, if L is a constant differential operator of order n, and m is a constant differential operator of order m, then when you sum them up, the order of this operator would be what? The highest of the two, though maximum of L and M. Okay. Correct. Uh, so the, I don't see a problem here. Uh, maybe I don't get your question properly. No, 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 ma'am. Uh, I get my doubt. Yeah, okay. is that okay? All right. Yes. So, so let let's just uh, quickly fix the proof of part one, and uh, let's see some examples uh, that will sort of uh, maybe iron out many many issues. So, what is the statement of one? Uh, the two operators L and M are the same if and only if the associated characteristic polynomials are the same. Okay, all right. Um, so, what is it? So, let's write the operator L. So, the, suppose this is an nth order uh, constant differential operator. I am going to denote the constants uh, by uh, A i's, and uh, let's write A as this. And suppose that capital M is an mth order uh, differential operator, and the constant here are denoted by B i's. Okay, so let's write the associated characteristic polynomials. By definition, uh, the characteristic polynomial associated to L is a, a order n polynomial, and the characteristic polynomial associated to M is an order m polynomial um, defined as follows, uh, as on the slide. Correct? Yeah. Uh, maybe you are getting too lost in the notation, but uh, it's. Uh, maybe when you know when we see examples it will sort of be comforting but let's see this proof okay um, so what is that we are want to say we we, we say that uh, so suppose so suppose that uh, the polynomials uh, pl and pm are same suppose that the two characteristic polynomials are the same yeah what does it mean it would mean the first thing is uh, the two polynomials are same if and only if their uh, their degree is same right so which means that n is equal to m and once the degree is same then what do you do then how do you say that the coefficients may i is much must match uh, how do you say that the coefficients match 
हाँ ना बाय बिकॉज़ ऑल द एक्स एक्स स्क्वायर एक्स क्यूब आर लिनियरली इंडिपेंडेंट करेक्ट सो यू यूजिंग द लिनियर इंडिपेंडेंस ऑफ राइट या वन एक्स एक्स स्क्वायर अप टू एक्स टू पार एन दे आर लिनियर दिस इज अ लिनियरली इंडिपेंडेंट सेट सो दैट वुड से दैट यू नो दिस कोफिशिएंस ऑफ द टू पॉलीनोमियल्स मस्ट मैच राइट so and if that is the case that implies that l is the same operator as the operator m correct correct is that okay with everybody yes, yes. so we have proved one part of uh, statement one of the previous theorem now on the you know for on the other hand let us suppose that the two operators are same we are required to show that the associated characteristic polynomials are also the same right now uh, what does it mean to say that the two operators are same if the two operators are same if they apply uh, you know if they sort of uh, apply to the same functions and they always produce the same result right okay all right uh, so if l is same as the operator m this would mean that l and m would yield the same output if i apply it to exponential rx right and this must be true for every real number r correct this is you know exponential rx is a very nice you know uh, function differentiable as many times as i want to so i don't have to worry whether uh, you know i can apply l or whether i can apply m to this op uh, to this function right so if i do that what is the left hand side here the left hand side would yield me the following right uh, and the right hand side by applying the operator m is what is written here on this slide correct is that okay yeah ma'am yeah and this is true please note that this is true for every real number r this last equation on this slide is true for every real number r so what can we conclude from this l equals to m if and only if p l equals to p correct so you know so let's just go slowly the first thing is we can cancel the exponential term because that never assumes the value zero if we cancel out that then what remains is on the left hand side is exactly the characteristic polynomial evaluated at r and the right hand side is exactly the characteristic polynomial for m evaluated at r right so the two must be the same that's what exactly this equation is saying the two must be same everywhere for each little r which is exactly saying that the two polynomials are the same correct is that okay yes ma'am yes so is this uh, proof okay with everybody present here yes ma'am yes ma'am okay yes, ma right. yeah okay all right uh, okay so then let's go ahead so you know what what is useful is uh, uh, when we associate a polynomial it is useful uh, the uh, you can appeal to the factorization you know uh, you you factorize the characteristic polynomial and that helps in constructing a basis of solution right so let's see uh, okay so let's sort of summarize um, so suppose that i have three constant coefficient linear differential operators ma'am sorry yes. to interrupt i yes. had a confusion yes. regarding the multiply mul l into m Yes. yes 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 uh, multiplication of uh, the two operators and uh, the composition of two operators will, would give the same operator right here because they are constant coefficients okay in but, general may not be right but here it would give here, here it's fine here if it's fine okay okay yeah okay. thank you yeah uh uh so um what is that i have here here we have three constant coefficient linear differential operators um suppose that the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator l uh, which is pl is the same as the one obtained by taking the product of the characteristic polynomial associated to m and the uh, characteristic polynomial associated to n now what does it mean the right hand side is exactly the polynomial associated to the operator m times n right that's what we discuss so by uh, part 1 of the theorem that we just discussed this is saying that the operator l is same as the operator m times n correct so in particular for example if the characteristic polynomial associated to l is 
you know let's say a0 x suppose this has this factorization you know a0 x minus r1 x minus r2 up to x minus rn then l is the operator a0 d minus r1 all the way d minus rn all this is saying is this corollary is saying the following thing that the order of the factors on the right when you write this you know when this right, when you write l this operator l as you know the this this product the order of the factors on the right can be chosen arbitrarily is that okay it does not matter whether you operate by d minus r2 first or whether you operate by d minus r1 first remember all of this is for constant coefficient linear differential operators does everybody understand what is this statement saying that is more important yes i mean it's just a different way of representing a polynomial Correct, correct. See polynomial. Whether you write, you know, x minus. Suppose you have a polynomial x minus one times x minus two, right? Whether you write x minus two first or whether you write x minus one first doesn't matter. Right. Same is the case with the linear differential operator. Is what this is saying. Whether you okay. write d minus r one first or whether you write d minus r two first, it doesn't matter. Whether you apply d minus r two first or whether you apply d minus r one first, it doesn't matter. all of this is fine because we are working with Con constant coefficient linear differential operators yes you know, you know this is not true in general right right the order in which the factors here cannot be chosen arbitrarily that is you know that is very sacred but over here it's all fine and that makes makes like yes, yeah yeah the constant right constant, is that okay right. so that's the that's all this corollary is saying Okay. Um. So I think. Uh, and so the polynomial is just a way of representing the differential operator. See, the polynomial is a way of representing a differential operator. One, two. The factorization of the polynomial helps in constructing a basis of the solution. You know, you remember what did we do when we were doing with order two case? We wrote down the polynomial, write down its roots, and the roots of the polynomial told us, you know, what is the solution space of the homogeneous differential equation. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So there, are, you know, two advantages here, right? Uh, we actually, you know, the whole, you know, end goal is to solve the differential equation, and the factorization of the polynomial, characteristic polynomial, helps in constructing the solution space. Writing, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, ma'am, uh, should not there be a uh, d minus r one i? Correct, correct. Yeah. So all of that is in understanding. Yeah. I was going to say that you know, in okay. when, whenever the constants are appearing, there is a you know identity operator here. There is an identity okay. operator here. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. Uh, but you know, sort of. Uh, uh, so I, I maybe I should have put a disclaimer that this is going to be uh, sort of the understanding in what follows, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for pointing this out. Okay, so having understood what the statement of the corollary is, uh, the the proof is actually quite uh, sort of straightforward. So um, once we agree uh, that you know uh, the characteristic polynomial associated to M times the characteristic polynomial associated to N by the theorem that we just discussed is the same as the characteristic polynomial associated to the operator M N. so which exactly means that the operator l and the operator mn must be the same and that's all uh, there is not much to the proof right but let let's see an example for example if the operator l is d square minus fd plus 6 so this is same as the operator d minus 3 times d minus 2 see this is only a order to operator so it seems like you know there is not much simplification but you know we'll see in examples that uh, the factorization really helps uh, uh, when uh, when you are solving differential equations we will see in examples but may maybe in another 5 minutes or so maybe i you know i've been promising examples for over an hour now but I, we, we will definitely see some examples but is this corollary okay with everybody present here Yes, ma'am. Yeah, everybody with me uh, up till this point. Ma'am. Uh, yes. Yes. Why are we? Uh, 
uh, it uh, seems obvious no and that uh, pl of x is equal to a not x minus r1 dot dot, dot x minus rn uh, so l is equal to a not uh, d minus r1 uh, dot, dot dot d minus rn so why are we emphasizing so much importance to this corollary see because you know there is a constant coefficient in general two operators you know what happen you, you cannot say that yeah yeah in general it's not but only because we are working with constant coefficient terms the, these it is okay yeah yeah uh, so you know um, so let's let's see some examples yeah uh, let's see uh, yeah um so you know i'm sort of sort of uh, sort of looks like going round and round about the same thing but <laughs> let me sort of do this for the sake of completeness and and you know believe me this is actually useful so suppose i am able to write an nth order uh, so this is an operator as a product of k linear differential operator with constant coefficient so i'm able to write l as a1 a2 ak now what is the simplification that this achieves for me what is the end goal i am looking at the solutions of the equation ly equal to 0 right that's the homogeneous nth order differential equation so which means that i am looking at elements in the kernel of l or the null space of l right now what this theorem is saying that the null space of the operator ai is actually contained in the null space of l right so anything that satisfies ai y equal to 0 will also be a solution of the homogeneous differential equation ly equal to 0 yes again you know please remember all of this goes through because we are working with constant coefficient linear differential operators yes um, so you know uh, so there is not much here in the proof but the proof actually uses the previous corollary uh, so let me emphasize this so suppose that i have f which is in the null space of the operator ai which means that if i apply ai on the function f then what i get is zero right uh, so now let me say that i want to claim that f is actually in the null space or the kernel of the operator l which means that l of f should be zero now l of f is exactly a1 a2 ak applied to f right but what am i going to go i am going to switch the order i am going to write ai first i am going to apply ai first and all the remain terms later so which would enable me to use the fact that f is actually in the null space of ai to write down this yes so i am using the previous corollary here is that okay And so I here the A I S are factors of the uh, factors of L. Factors of L, right, right, right. In the like. sense described above, you know, described on the previous side, A I is a factor of L, meaning what? You write down the characteristic polynomial, you know, and associated, you know. Yeah. So like d minus three and d minus two. Correct. 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 Much like that. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. so you know what is this hat means hat means that this term ai is not here ai is being omitted from this product and this is i am able to so you know uh, to begin with what i know is l is the product a1 a2 ak i can switch the order move around using the previous corollary and i can apply ai first and others later doesn't matter i'll get the same output yes and i'm doing this because i know that f is in the all space of ai is that okay uh, yes ma'am ma so how did how are we saying that the null space of ai i mean uh, when when can this happen when the null space of ai is equal to the null space of l um can can this happen any uh, i mean i i don't see it happening uh, if n is equal to 1 a minus 2 suggestion a, n is equal to uh, sorry i didn't get it uh, what is the suggestion where does this happen and so if there is only one a okay. uh, i mean yeah, yeah. The, if it's linear then sure, then it's sure. only yeah um, uh, in general can that happen um, i don't know let's think about some examples ma'am or any example like t minus 1 raised to power n okay so all all the a's will be the same okay so the null space of a 1a is the same as null space of all the other a's which is okay. the same as null space of l 
okay yeah that but is. in that case uh, we uh, there's no point i mean we can't write l equal to a1 a2 ak as a product of uh, a constant linear differential operators because that's going to be the same basically so why can't we write it as well as like in the format basically it's like an operator so it doesn't commutate with all things like basically that this is what we are basically learning that only the ones we can prove it for so it does commutate with constants but like uh, remember there was this question which we had broken up and the the the, the function was 1 by x there it didn't commutate and hence gave the wrong answer okay. it's very similar to how certain operators in physics commutate while the others don't Right, right. So commutate that's, means you can basically sorry. just apply it in any order. Yeah. So you know that's a separate question. Uh, we'll uh, come to that little later. But as long as we we are in this world of constant differential operators, everything is fine. Sorry, uh, differential operators with constant coefficients, things are fine. Now coming to back to your question of null space of A I equaling null space of L. Uh, yeah. I would apologize. I don't think I know an example on top of my head except for what your friends are suggesting. Uh, so maybe I'll think about it a little bit and get back to you tomorrow in the discussion session. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's just uh, go ahead. Uh, oh, good God, Lord. Yeah. We finally have an example. Good. Uh, so suppose let's look at an order three linear differential equation with constant coefficients. Um, okay. So I'm going to use the operator notation and I'm going to write this as uh, the uh, associated operator here is. D three, yeah, D Q D three minus seven D plus six I. Okay, all right. Um, now, how do I write? Go ahead from this point. I look at the associated characteristic polynomial, right? So, which is in this case x cube minus seven x plus six, right? So, what are the roots of the characteristic polynomial in this case? One, one of them is one. So one of them is one, right? So once you figure out one of the root, then then you get a quadratic, and it's easy to sort of uh, factorize that, right? So it turns out x minus one, x minus two, x minus three. These are factors, and uh, we are a quadrat. Uh, so we have a cubic polynomial. So we're done. Okay. So which means that uh, by what we just discussed, one is able to write down this operator L as the product d minus one, d minus two, and d plus three. And what is that one should do? One should look at the kernel of each of these three operators, linear operators of order one operators, right? So what is in the kernel of d minus one? So I'm looking at the solution space d minus one. Applied to y equals zero. So, what is the solution space of that? E bar, e bar x. E to power x, right? And similarly for d minus two, what is in the kernel of the operator d minus two? E raised to two x. And the kernel of the operator d plus three? E raised to minus three. E raised to minus three. Three, right? So we have, we know, we can write down actually the. Um, Basis of the solution space of each of the operators d minus one, d minus two, and d minus three. Sorry, d plus three. Correct. Now each of these op each of these functions e to power x, e to power two x, and e to power minus three x are in the kernel of L by what we just discussed, right? And luckily they are all linearly independent, right? And what is the dimension theorem tells us? The dimension theorem tells us that this third order Linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficient. Uh, the solution set of this differential equation will be a vector space of dimension three, and we have been able to find three linearly independent solutions. So we are quite done. So this is indeed a basis of the kernel of L, and that would imply that the general solution is given as linear combination of the basis elements, and we are quite done. Is that okay? Um, why did you quote that? Luckily, they are uh, linearly independent. B won't it happen every time we they get? They may not uh, be right. No, could have been a repeated root, na? Right. They can no, it may not be right. Okay, like d minus one. Yeah. If it was a repeated one. root, then then what would be root, right? Okay. Yeah, understood. So if we had a repeated root, what would we have done here? Suppose it it was d minus one square. We we will see those examples. Let me just postpone that question, right? We will see what happens if we had a repeated root, right? 
but this example is okay right everybody is with me up till this point yes ma'am okay all right uh Ma'am, but this is very sel uh, very similar to the form we had done in the uh, second order where the correct, solution correct. was erased to mx. Correct, 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 correct. Very similar. Right. So the, basically, that's the same thing we are doing, right? Just breaking it into factors and. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. That's so exactly. the polynomial is basically the same. Like if you substitute it with erased to m, you get the same solution. Right. Yeah, precise. Yes. Yes. See, order three, order four equations are easy, uh, easy in the sense that uh, tractable because order three and order four polynomials one knows how to solve. Beyond that, it's sort of uh, very difficult, right? Uh, Correct. That's right. Yeah. So, true. but let's see what can one do, right? Okay. Um, so this example illustrates uh, the case when the characteristic polynomial admits distinct real roots, right? Uh, so in general, if the characteristic polynomial has uh, n distinct roots r1, r2, rn, then the basis of the solution space of L y equal to zero, the associated homogeneous differential equation, is going to be e to power r1 x e to power r2 x e to power rn x, right? So what we know at this point of time is that each of these functions, you know, exponential r1 x, exponential r2 x, exponential rn x, these are all in the null space of uh, the operator L. Yeah? So these are all the solutions of uh, the homogeneous differential equation L y equal to zero. One should check that these are linearly independent. And hence, this is a basis of the solution space. Is that OK? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. OK, all right. Um, so let me just uh, What's sorry. different? Uh... Sorry, yes. Somebody wanted to say something? So is the concept similar to when there are equal roots and do we multiply by x? Sure, or sure. Do we find another yeah, case? yeah, much the same. We we we'll just, just discuss that. Yeah. Another okay. two minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me sort of complete the uh, distinct real roots case. Uh, so what is that I wanted to say here? Suppose you have a constant coefficient linear differential operator of order n such that the associated characteristic polynomial has n distinct real roots. Then the general solution of the homogeneous differential equation is given as a linear combination of exponential r1x, exponential r2x, and exponential rnx, right? Um, all right. So this is this is uh, follows that using the factorization of the characteristic polynomial, one writes down uh, the equivalent factorization of uh, the operator L, and one knows how to actually compute the null space of each of the constituents. You know, uh, sort of factors d minus r i, and we are quite done. Uh, all that remains to check is that uh, you know these these. Um, Exponential r1x, exponential r2x, exponential rnx. This is a linearly independent set, right? Okay. Uh, so I, I leave this for you to check. Yeah. Uh, all you need to do is just write down the definition, and uh, and it should fall through, right? Uh, the linear independence of the these n functions over uh, the real line. Is that okay? But now I send the first yeah. place. We are yeah. saying R1, R2, Rn are Correct. all distinct. So, I mean, they have to be linearly independent. Na? E to the power R1x, E to the power R2x. Correct, correct. So, so how do you... How... Yeah, yeah. So, give me, you know, one minute. So, so how do you prove using the definition of linearly independent? See, when we were only two, you know, when, we, when, when N was two, then you say that, you know, R1 and R2 are distinct. So, you know, one is not a constant multiple of the other and you're done. But when you have n of them, then how do you sort of rigorously prove that? Just using the definition, it will fall through. All you have to do is just write down. What is the definition of n functions being linearly independent? Uh, what the is a the... linear combination. So suppose that there are constants, you know, c1, c2, cn, such that c1 exponential r1x plus c2 exponential r2x plus cn exponential rnx is zero. That must force that each of these constants must be zero, right? That's what linear independence the definition means, right? Correct? So you just yes. prove that. Just prove that. That's all. Is that okay? Does everybody follow? What is that you are required to do? 
do i hear a yes yes ma'am okay. yes ma'am okay all right good okay so can we proceed from this point uh oh all right um so let's look at the case when the polynomial the characteristic polynomial has some repeated roots uh, so as uh, uh, as we know what is that we did for uh, order 2 case we got one solution using the characteristic equation the characteristic polynomial and the other solution was obtained uh, by looking at solutions of the form v times f and that yielded us that v must be x so we what we get it x times exponential mx as the other solution okay so the first thing is here right uh, the first observation is the following that for any real number r the functions u1 u2 um defined as exponential rx x times exponential rx x to the power m minus 1 exponential rx are linearly independent and each of them are actually solutions of d minus r to the power m y equals 0 so each of them is actually in the null space of the operator d minus r to the power m yeah so this is exactly like what we did for order two equations little more generality so i hope the statement is okay with everybody present here so we are looking at uh, the case when the characteristic polynomial has repeated roots if that is the case we would like to claim that you know uh, you would you know sort of look at exponential rx x times exponential rx and x to power m minus 1 exponential rx you would say that each of this is a solution of the associated uh, homogeneous differential equation and actually these are linearly independent so that's very nice so is that okay yes so this is uh, particularly for the case where l equal to d minus r the whole raised to m correct correct there are all the roots are repeated right right so we will see you know what if there is a product with another factor that will come little later uh, we are going to discuss that give me you know let me just fix fix this that's going to come next we are going to address that question next so i'm just to confirm uh... here all the roots are repeated not some roots are repeated i mean all the roots are repeated here yes 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 so oh. i am looking at l equal to d minus r to the power m as far as this proposition is concerned uh yeah yes ma'am yes, yes yes so we are we will discuss that case a little later you know once we are sort of done through this proposition what happens if there are some repeated roots and some not and what not right that that will also come right but as far as this proposition is concerned uh, just all of them are repeated roots uh, so there's only one root with multiplicity that's all yes uh, that would be a better way of uh, saying okay uh, so uh, so you know the first thing is easy uh, the first observation is that you know uh, linear independence of these functions u1 up to um so you know that 1 x x square x to power m this is a linearly independent set so uh, it is immediate that exponential rx x times exponential rx x to power m minus 1 exponential rx so ideally there should be a parenthesis here i'll fix that this is a linearly independent set correct i hope everybody is with me up till this point yes uh, yeah uh, what is that we need to show we need to show that each of these functions are actually in the null space of the operator d minus r to the power m and how would one go about proving such a thing you use the principle of mathematical induction right so let's just do it for the case m equal to 1 so if m equal to 1 we are required to show that u1 equal to exponential rx is in the null space of operator d minus r which is what we know right now uh, so this is okay right this is good okay so what happens for m equal to 2 now m equal to 2 means we have to show that u1 u2 are in the null space of d minus r to the power 2 okay all right now u1 is in the kernel of d minus r right we just agreed so that means that it is also in the kernel of d minus r square right correct that's that's okay right this was one of the uh, corollaries that we discussed right so which means that d minus r square operated on u1 equals 0 which means that we we are 
front right so what we need to check is d minus r square operated on u2 should also yield zero right so let's check that so we are going to write d minus r square as d minus r d minus r apply d minus r first which means that you are differentiating x uh right we are differentiating right so we get x r exponential r x plus exponential r x minus r x exponential r x okay and you apply this operator one more time and what you get is zero so conclusion u2 is in the kernel of d minus r square right is that okay u1 u2 is in the kernel of d minus r square right that's what we have uh, proved up till this point okay yes, yes? all right um, how do we prove this in general use the principle of mathematical addition so suppose that up till stage m minus 1 the statement is true which means that u1 u2 um minus 1 are in the null space of the operator uh, d minus r to the power m minus 1 we will show that u1 u2 um is in the null space of the operator d minus r to the power m okay now uh, what is that we know by induction hypothesis we know that u1 u2 um minus 1 are in the null space of the operator uh, d r minus r to the power m minus 1 so all of these function will also be in the null space of the operator d minus r to the power m correct yes is that okay what is that we are required to show we are required to show that um is in the null space of the operator d minus r to the power m that's what we are required to show actually everybody with me up till this point yeah yes yes yes, yes, yes okay so let's let's look at this how do we show that um is in the null space of uh, the operator d minus r to the power m So let's apply. Let's apply d minus r m to the uh, function u m. Yeah, which means that you know u m was you know. Please mute yourself. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, u m uh, was the notation for the function x to the power m minus one exponential r x. So I am going to write down the operator d minus r to the power m as d minus r to the power m minus one. Times uh, d minus r. Let's apply d minus r. So if I apply d minus r to this function u m, I will get the following. Yeah. So I am differentiating exponential here, and then I am differentiating x to the power n minus one. Yeah. And then multiplying by r. Right. Um. So what do I? So is there some simplification? Yes, there is. There is some simplification. This is exactly. Um. M minus one to the power x minus x to the power m minus two exponential r x. Correct? Is that okay? Yes, yeah. ma'am. First and the last term cancel out. Now what is this? This term is exactly u m minus one, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, this is exactly u m minus one. This is a constant here. It doesn't matter. You can pull it out. So we are done, right? Because by assumption. U m minus one is in the null space of the operator d minus r to the power m minus one. Is that okay? So we are yes, done. Yeah, the proof is complete using the principle of mathematical injunction. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, so let's just uh, summarize all of this. Um, so this was uh, proposition when. we had only repeated roots suppose that the characteristic polynomial looked like this yeah which means that there are uh, distinct roots r1 r2 rl each repeated e1 e2 and el times respectively right okay so then uh, so and you know uh, so looking at uh, summation ei is n uh, so the order of the degree of this polynomial is n so what would be the uh, basis of the solution space of uh, the equation ly equal to 0 it would be so this term x minus r1 to the power e1 would dictate that 
exponential r1 x x times exponential r1 x x to the power e1 minus 1 exponential r1 x these are all solutions right and likewise uh, this this will be the contribution from this term right x minus r to the power e2 and uh, likewise the last here a term here x minus r l to the power e l would contribute these terms right so these are all solutions of this uh, of the homogeneous equation l y equal to 0 the point to note is that all these functions are linearly independent since there are n of them this would actually give us a basis of the equation yeah so i think i i will just stop right here uh, for now uh, let me just stop the recording and i i'll take your questions if any